Okay, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Gordon MacDonald, MSP. Many of you, many of you will know Gordon MacDonald. Um, he's, he's our very active member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh Pentlands, winning it from the Tories in 2011. Um, he's lived in Ed the Edinburgh area since the early 1990s and has been an active SNP member since in the 1970s and is the former chief accountant with Lothian Buses. He sits on the infrastructure... <laughs> he sits on the infrastructure and capital investment and the education and culture committees in the Scottish Parliament. So, Gordon, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cathy, for uh, those kind words. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and it's uh, good to see such a fantastic turnout on a wet Friday night. As your local member of the uh, Scottish Parliament, uh, I would like to thank you all for coming out along tonight to listen to myself and especially to our two guest speakers, and hopefully you will go away having your questions about independence answered. Next year will mark my um, 40th anniversary as a member of the SNP and an active member of the SNP. And during that time, over three dozen countries have become independent, from, and including eight countries gaining their independence from Britain. Not one of them, or any other country in the world, has chosen to become a la part of a larger nation during that same period. Indeed, we Scots never chose to become part of the Union in 1707 because, as we didn't have the vote, we were never asked. But the Edinburgh citizens showed their displeasure by rioting in the streets when the Act was signed. Now, for the first time in 307 years, you will have the opportunity to express your opinion in a democratic vote about whether Scotland should rejoin the family of nations or remain as a region of Britain. In addition, a yes vote will return democracy to Scotland in that not only will we get the government that Scotland votes for, but policies that Scotland does not agree with will no longer be foisted on us. Since 1950, Scotland has voted Tory six years out of 64 but has had a Tory government for 39 out of those years. Scotland's 59 MPs will always be outvoted by the 591 from the rest of the UK, and we've witnessed the outcome of this time and time again. 91% of Scots MPs voted against the bedroom tax, but it was imposed by the UK government. 81% of Scots MPs voted against welfare cuts, but Westminster imposed it. 80% of Scots don't want Trident, but Westminster wants to keep it. 79% of Scots MPs voted against the Royal Mail sell-off, yet it was imposed by the UK government. And more than half of Scots MPs voted against war in Iraq, yet we still went to war. Independence will end that democratic deficit. However, independence is not an end in itself, but is the key to unlocking Scotland's potential that will enable us to build an inclusive society that nurtures people, not discards, that is fair and inclusive and has the priorities that put people before profit where nuclear weapons will be removed, no longer endangering our largest city, and the money saved can be redirected to support our economy. The Scottish economy is at the heart of the independence debate, as it provides the means to build that better society, far from the current UK austerity measures. Scotland has been in a stronger fiscal position than the rest of the UK in four of the last five years. Over that period, with 8.4% of the UK population, 
Scotland has generated 9.5% of UK revenues and received back 9.3% of UK spending. This means that over five years to 2013, Scotland's finances were stronger than the UK's as a whole by 8.3 billion. That's 20,000 pounds per man, woman and child. The Financial Times on the 3rd of February stated that the Scottish economy would rank among the top 50 in the world by size of GDP and would be relatively wealthy, richer than the rest of the UK and in the top 20 countries globally in terms of GDP per head. Scotland is one of the few places in the UK that is still a net exporter, with Scottish exports reaching close to £100 billion in 2012. This would mean that Scotland has an income stream from selling abroad to support jobs and services here at home. The Financial Times commented that the total of £98 billion would place Scotland 34th among global exporters. Much of that trade is to Europe, and the Scottish Government has stated its intention to continue its EU membership. As European citizens, we have accrued rights for 40 years, and our laws are aligned with European law. Jim Curry, former European Commission Director General, stated, everyone would recognise an independent Scotland's right to be an EU member, and it would be very difficult for an EU member state to try and block that membership. I don't see that happening. Scotland's companies are not only global exporters, but trade with our neighbours in the UK. Therefore, a currency union where Scotland continued to use the pound would be a sensible option for all concerned. The Scottish Government's Fiscal Commission that contains two Nobel laureates looked at the currency options and decided that continued use of the pound made best economic sense for all concerned. Australia, Ireland and New Zealand continued to use the pound for 60 years after independ their independence and there is no mechanism to stop Scotland from doing the same. Edinburgh is a new European capital of an independent Scotland We'll likely see a significant expansion in the number of diplomatic missions located here in our city. Currently, there are only 11 international consulates, where Dublin hosts 61, with more than 300 accredited diplomats and hundreds of local staff, all employed by other governments, contributing tens of millions into the local community. Scotland, as a similar-sized nation, could expect at least the same levels of representation. There will be other sources of employment, such as the posts created from the transfer of powers from Westminster, covering defence, welfare, the economy and international affairs. And these are jobs that we already pay for from our taxes, but are, are located in and around London. Tourism will also receive a boost as our international profile increases throughout the world at the same time as we cut air passenger duty by 50%. But more importantly, we will have the fiscal levers to attract employers or to support our own homegrown new businesses in Scotland and to provide more employment. In order to take advantage of these new employment opportunities, the Scottish Government would increase childcare for all three and four-year-old children to match the same number of hours children spend at primary school. This will encourage many women to return to work and the extra taxes generated will help to support the increased childcare provision. By continually driving down unemployment, we will have the opportunity to design an efficient and fair welfare system that meets the needs of those who depend on it and treats them with dignity and respect while supporting those who can to find work. Scotland, as part of the UK, is the fourth most unequal country in the developed world. Independence gives us the opportunity to change that. Scotland has paid more in tax per head in each of the last 30 years 
than the rest of the UK. Unfortunately, our financial strength cannot at present be used to tackle the many issues we have, as Westminster is currently cutting our budget by close to 11% in real terms between 2010 and 2016. So, we have the opportunity on the 18th of September to build a new Scotland, where decisions will be made by the people who care most about Scotland, that is the people who live in Scotland. Let's take up that opportunity. Let's vote yes.